And so if you would stand to your feet, we're going to jump into our cortex and we're going to ride this thing. We're going to ride it on out. I need a little help. So in the first service, uh, Eric, my friend, he was, he was, you was blessing me, sir. I want to thank you because they was real quiet. <laughs> they was, wasn't they? I don't know what that's all about, but uh, Eric was encouraging me. So we're going to the first, uh, first Corinthians, the 11th chapter and the first verse. It's our core text for this sermon series. And also, there's a, a QR code on the screen, and that's for those of you who, um, who choose to follow along and to uh, maybe study and continue the study and allow the Lord to continue the conversation with you long after we've left this place. We've put a QR code on the screen for you to scan my notes, and so I encourage you to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, Be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Father, I thank you that your word is blessed. And not only is the word blessed, but the hearer is blessed if we would endeavor to do what we have heard. So I thank you, Father, that we will not just be hearers of the word this morning, but we will be doers in Jesus' name. If you agree, would you say amen? You can take your seat. So uh, several several months ago, uh, Pastor Daly introduced this this phrase. He was teaching, and and at one point of the message, he said, "May you be covered with the dust of the rabbi." You remember that? How many of y'all remember that message? Seven people. Great. So if you, if you, <laughs> that message marked me, and in my visual, uh, uh, this this text reminds me of that message. Paul is saying, look, follow, follow me as I follow Christ. And, and my first thought as I was pondering this was, Lord, I want to follow so close that I am uncomfortable and inconvenienced. And as, as I was driving here this morning, I thought to myself, and I've almost come to this conclusion. If you are a comfortable Christian, you might not be doing it right. I'm just saying, I haven't quite com concluded, but I'm close to concluding that if you are comfortable in your Christianity and you don't feel stretched and you don't feel provoked and you don't feel uncomfortable and you don't feel inconvenient, you might not be doing it right. <laughs> Amen. I'm just saying, listen, I am tore up. And, and it's like, it's like, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. This text also just, just how it conveys to me is follow God in such a way that you are constantly, constantly being challenged and you see yourself. You're so busy seeing yourself and the adjustments and the realignments that you need to make in your own life. You really don't have time to point your finger at anybody else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to be under the influence because of my proximity. So I'm married to my high school sweetheart, and, and you guys have heard this story before, but just act like this is your first time hearing it. So we've been together since we were 15. He had three hairs on his chest, and his voice still was, had the yodel in it, you know, the yodel. It hadn't quite, you know, got that barren tone uh, yet, but, but we've been together a long time, and, and we're about to uh, come up on our 39th year of marriage. Yeah. Yes, and, and I, I say that because there, there are some things that just happen over time because of the relationship that we've cultivated. We had to work. Marriage is work, right? F following Jesus is work. It is. And the more you put into following him, the more you'll get out of it. And the more you put in, into it, the more compelling your life will be for those who are watching. And when you invite them, your life will have the appeal and they will respond to your invitation. And so this is, this is a very unconventional approach to, to this message. And, and I, I remember a couple of days ago, pastor said someone made a comment. Hey, you preached real deep. I mean, the revelation, the, the sermon series on revelation was deep and broad. And I mean, it was impactful. And now, you know, we kind of like, you know, this milk message kind of was the implication that they were they're trying to make. And, and I submit to you, I, 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 I beg to differ. 
Because if, if I handle this message right and if you hear it right, it will be it would be far from a milky message. You, I want you to leave uncomfortable this morning. I want you to feel the pressure. I want you to feel the discomfort and the inconvenience of obedience. Do you understand? Obedience should be uncomfortable. Amen. And sometimes we live comfortable because we take the, 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 uh, the commands of the spirit as, as suggestions. And so we live and we are asleep in what I call our carnal calm. And we mistake it as peace. But I'm telling you right now, we should be provoked and stirred because there are some disturbing statistics as it relates to uh, who is identifying as Christ followers in this day that we're living in. 63%, somewhere in that range, just 63% of Americans identify as Christians. And that's down from 86% uh, about 20 years ago. There's this steep decline in people who are identifying as Christ's followers. And so our, our church is, is really young. Mosaic is young and, and there's a lot of millennials here and, and that's folks who've been, uh, who were born between, I believe, 81 and 96. Um, a lot of millennials and there's about 72 million millennials in the, in, uh, the United States. About 72 million and about 48 million millennials identify as religious nuns, N-O-N-E, nuns, meaning they're either identifying as agnostic, they're identifying as atheists, or they have no particular uh, interest in religion at all. And I call them the doomed, and that's just one demographic, the doomed. And you're like, Yolanda, why you, you know, why you got to use that word? Because I think sometimes we become desensitized to things that we should always feel this, this sense of, of urgency, but we become desensitized and familiar. You know, so, so we, we become desensitized to the term unsaved or, 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 or desensitized to the, 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 the term the loss. But this morning, I, I want it to feel weighty to you. I'm going to call them the doomed. Do you know why? Because if you don't invite them, if we don't invite them, now understand that we have to take the gospel to the world. But there is great value in us understanding that we have to bring the world to the gospel. And if you don't invite them, they're doomed. Don't assume, I want you to have that mindset, don't assume that someone else is gonna invite them. Amen? There was a survey done by um, the Billy Graham Association and in this survey, uh, it, it, it showed that seven, excuse me, the average Christian uh, has relationship with seven unchurched people, whether they're an associate, whether they're a, a worker, whether they're someone that you encounter frequently at Walmart or whatever, or whether it's a, relate, uh, a relative, but the average Christian has relationship with seven unchurched people. And this morning, I want you to feel provoked by the Spirit to invite one. One at a time. You gotta invite them. You understand what I'm saying? Don't, don't hear this statistic and, and it just be another statistic. Because as we live in what I called a carnal calm, people are dying. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to follow Jesus in such a way, in such proximity that what grieves him grieves me. And I guarantee you, he's grieved about the souls who are doomed. And I want to be grieved too. And I want to be shaken out of my carnal calm. I get it. Listen, when I go to Walmart, I'm hoping I don't engage a human being. <laughs> And I know y'all laughing because I'm the only one in this place that goes to Walmart and you see somebody that you know and you don't want to be bothered. So you just kind of take a little, you know. I have a friend that will remain nameless, but they go to Walmart and they have headphones on. Whether something playing in the headphones or not. And a hoodie. Just so they don't have to engage. 
And that's, that's funny, right? But I, 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 I will tell you, I've been convicted. I, I, I've been convicted because that's my comfortable place because I am an introvert. I'm an introvert and I'd rather not be bothered. I mean, I, I, I will love on people and, and what you get is truly authentic. But when I'm done, I'm done. I'm all talked out. I'm done now. I'm done. I get it. But if we're not careful, our personality type will cause us to negotiate the commands, discard, be distracted, and be deterred from our kingdom responsibilities. My personality doesn't absolve me of my responsibility to the kingdom. Do you understand? And so the Holy Spirit wants to give you strategy that helps you to navigate your personality so that you can be obedient to his command. Amen. So my challenge to you, I'm going to give you the call to action right up front. My challenge to you is identify seven unchurched people in your scope of influence. Make a list, I've already made my list. It wouldn't even have felt right coming and telling you to do it and I didn't do it. I've made my list. Some of them are by name and some of them are just by uh, uh, routine encounter. And I'm gonna invite them. I don't wanna do it without the Holy Spirit. I don't wanna do it without, you know, just going by my emotions. But I will tell you that the Holy Spirit, if you give him access, he will give you the right strategy for the right moment to say the right thing and get the intended result. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we are compromising and calling it strategy. Because we're comfortable. So we're compromising to a place of comfortability and to a place of convenience. And really, we're calling it strategy, but that's compromise. Are you, saying, are you hearing what I'm saying? Am I talking good? Make sure y'all tell pastor. Seven. You are, you are an above average Christian. The statistic said the average Christian knows seven unchurched people before this day is out. I challenge you, make a list of the seven and invite them one at a time. Are you with me? So, so be, before I move on, we, we've got to talk about the elephant in the room. And, and we're encouraging you to invite folks to church, but the church has problems. The church has problems. That's us, but the church has problems. It's true. It's true. The church has problems. And, and if the statistics are correct, it appears that the church has lost her appeal. And I submit to you that that, that is very much true, that God hasn't lost his appeal, but the church has lost, has lost its appeal. And I submit to you that the reason why the church has lost its appeal is because church people have lost their perspective and their zeal. They have forgotten who they are and why they are. We have forgotten who we are and why we are. And so when our life is inconsistent with, with what it looks like to be a Christ follower, there is no power in the appeal. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say when you're not living what you're talking about. Amen. And I believe we are, we are a generation. This is a generation where people are looking for authenticity. It's like they can see a, a, a counterfeit a mile away. You can fool a whole lot of people, but you can't fool everybody. And those who are really paying attention, you can't fool them. Amen. Amen. And that's the gravity of that, that core text. Follow me as I follow Christ. Your proximity to Jesus should be such that the stuff in your character that is incongruent with the, the character of Christ, it's right up in your face and you have to contend with it. And my encouragement to you, this is, this is uh, one of my life hacks. Don't ignore what you should be contending with. Because if you confront it, you are posturing yourself for deliverance. But if you pretend that, that you're good, you are positioning yourself to continue to be a prisoner of that stronghold, whatever it is. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
six people are listening. That's amazing. That's good odds here. We're doing really good. Hallelujah. There's something about what we're doing and how we're doing this Christian life that has caused us to lose our influence, weaken our influence and, and weaken our impact. And listen, God wants to deal with that. He wants to deal with it. What one of the thoughts that, that I had was when I when I first got saved, do y'all remember when you first got saved? Do you remember when you how zealous you were? I was 13 years old. I, I, I was 13 years old and I had done a whole lot of things that a 13 year old should not have done. You understand? And I got radically saved at a revival because my grandmother invited me. And I remember my, my zeal. It was like, listen, everybody around me getting saved. Cause, cause the, the intensity of, of what had happened to me was so fresh and so, so real that I just wanted to share it. It was authentic. I knew God was real and I felt like the least I could do is to share this Jesus with everybody. And how many of you can, can be honest and say that over, if you've been saved any length of time, you've had to be renewed and refreshed and that zeal has had to be restirred because life will take your zeal away. Yes, trouble will cause you to compromise and cause you to, to uh, um, make, make excuses for the things that you should be contending with. It just becomes your unconfronted excuse and you begin to just live that way and it's just the way it is. But I'm telling you this morning that the Holy Spirit wants to challenge you. And he wants to shake us from this carnal calm that makes us feel comfortable and we think it's peace. It's not peace. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? God has not lost his appeal while the church is, 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 is diminished in her effect. I'm telling you, God has not lost his appeal. The Holy Spirit is just as powerful today as he was in Genesis and in Revelation. Amen. And he wants us to live in such a way and, and in such proximity to follow in such proximity that that power and that influence and that appeal is contagious and undeniable. And when we extend the invitation, there will be something behind our voice and not just our personality. There'll be power behind it because you are aiming to push past your places of discomfort and just be obedient. Yes. Amen. Amen. We all, we all can agree that obedience is uncomfortable, right? Yes. It's inconvenient, right? Yes. But can I tell you something? Ooh, the spoils of obedience are far more valuable than the temporary rewards of comfort and convenience. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? The spoils of obedience, my God, who can measure them? But the spoils of obedience are far, far more valuable than the temporary reward of convenience and comfortability. And I want the spoils of obedience. Do you hear what I'm saying? My God, I do, I do. And it's unfortunate, but it's true. Many of us in, in the, the church house, if you will, we are, we are um, quick to embrace the benefits of Christianity and we want to claim all the scriptures and all the blessings of being a Christian, but we want to distance ourselves and absolve ourselves from the responsibility and the obligation of being a Christian. Amen. And I don't want to be comfortable enjoying the, the spoils, if you will, of being a Christian and not lend myself to the responsibility of being a Christian. Amen. And every Christian that is convinced and lives convinced will share with somebody. Are you uncomfortable yet? Eight people are uncomfortable. Amen. 
My God. So we know, we see the world, we know what's happening in the world, and, and we know that the world has infiltrated the church, and, and I'm just heightening the awareness because we are the church, and so if the world has influenced the church, and if we are practicing the mannerisms of a, of a counter kingdom culture and an antichrist culture, that means that you and I are guilty of that. Amen. And so it's, it's a time, it's time for us to awaken and to be stretched and to be reminded of who we are. To be reminded of who we are. There's certain things that I'm sure of because I'm in that role and it's just, it's just, it, it just is. I am Damon's wife. Right? I, I, I have, I have uh, three beautiful children, adult children. I'm their mama. And, you know, I function in that role and I'm reminded because of our proximity. And I'm telling you, your proximity with your Jesus will cause you to live reminded of who you are. And what happens when we, when we, there's too much distance in our follow. Yeah. Yeah. Amnesia sets in. You understand what I'm saying? And so our conversation and we're so casual and careless with our conversation because it's likely that there's been some distance in our follow and we've forgotten who we are. Amen. But we are the church, flaws and all. We are the church. The church is still God's idea. Gathering in the church house is still God's kingdom strategy. Amen. We have to re be reminded of who we are and to be reminded, listen, a whole dispensation has been carved out in the timeline of eternity for the church to have her finest hour before the, 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 the return of Jesus Christ. A whole dispensation. What is a dispensation? It's, it can be described as a, a divine arrangement. A divine arrangement. And essentially, the dispensation, the mosaic dispensation, not the, not the church, but the person. The mosaic dispensation, God dwelled in a, a, a tent and the priests represented the people. And in the Christian dispensation, the dispensation of the church, God dwells in temples, not made with hands. A whole dispensation has been carved out for the church. For us to be the, 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 the impact in the earth. To, to bridge between when Jesus rose and when he will return. The dispensation of the church. And if we are reminded of who we are and why we are, we would live different. Amen. We are the hope for the world. Are you listening to me? We are the hope for the world. Flaws and all. And the Lord knew the condition that the church would be in when he penned these words that we're going to go through these scriptures here in just a moment. He knew what condition we would be in, yet he said some things. So even though there are things that are jacked up in the church, can we say jacked up? <laughs> there are certain words I say and pastor just thinks it's a cuss word like sucked. <laughs> I know he's watching. I said, pastor, that is not a cuss word. I don't cuss. But there's a lot of things that are wrong with the church. Yet it's God's kingdom strategy. Amen. Another definition of dispensation is divine administration. It's a way of organizing and executing authority. And the church has been given this crucial responsibility to function and steward revelation and truth as kings and priests. Amen. That's who we are. Flaws and all, that's who we are. Amen. As kings, kings rule with their words and their positional authority. Psalm says, who is man that thou art mindful of him? And that you have placed him just a little lower than the angels and given him authority. We are to rule as kings in the earth with our words and our positional authority being reminded of who we are. And as a priest, priests rule with their prayers and their spiritual influence. Yeah. Hallelujah. We are chosen. We are royal priests. And priests stand in the posture to make intercession 
for the doomed. Hallelujah. That's who we are. My God, my God, the dispensation of the church. This is no time to have an identity crisis. Because the stakes are too high. The stakes are too high. Those who are categorized as the doomed, the number is increasing. We got work to do. Amen. 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 So it's not time to, to, to be worried about material things. It's not. This is not the time to be distracted. This is not the time to stay discouraged. This is not the time to, 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 to live deterred. Amen. Hallelujah. Flaws and all. So even today with all of the flaws in the church, it's still God's design that we compel people to come to the church house so that they can be postured for impact. And if we don't, they are doomed. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Is that an over-dramatization? No. It's not. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18 through 20, reading the NIV. And then again, you've got the QR code to scan if you want to follow along and just have the notes for later. But Jesus knew the state of the church when he spoke these words in Matthew 28. I'm going to tell you that the state of the church is not a surprise to God. And yet we are, have not been absolved of our responsibility. Are you hearing me this morning? Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go. Doesn't sound like a suggestion to me though. You know what I mean? There's a little weight on that. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you. You don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to go alone. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What age? The dispensation of the church. Are you tracking? The Lord knew the church would lose focus and be guilty of unmentionable things when he spoke these words in Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. In the previous verses, verses 16 through 20 in the parable, the parable illustrates a man who has prepared a feast and he has given instructions for the invitation list. And many um, uh, responded to those instructions with their, uh, with their excuses of why they couldn't come, and why they couldn't follow instructions and why they couldn't accept the invitation. And, and as the parable goes on, it says, and all of those... Let me paraphrase it. That were too busy to accept my invitation will not partake in the feast that I've prepared. Is anybody here this morning? The father knew that pastors would fail. The father knew that there would be what we call church hurt because people fail people. He knew at some point performance and uh, 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 production and programming would replace the presence. And yet, he inspired these words in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, For not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. I'm exhorting you today. Exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. What day? The end of this dispensation of the church. We got work to do. Seven. 
the average Christian is in relationship with seven unchurched people. Make your list of the seven. On my list, I've got four names, and then I've got um, three, because I don't know their name, but I, I encounter them routinely. And so now I'm posturing myself on purpose. Lord, give me the strategy. I don't want to do it alone anyway. You know, that's, that's when you get burnt out when you do things without the, the, the help of the Holy Spirit. You just do it in your own strength. But I'm telling you, there's a strategy for your personality that will help you contend with your personality and inconvenience yourself to be obedient. Would you lean into that? Are you here this morning? Can you give God some praise? Hallelujah. I'm almost done. I know y'all ready to go too. Y'all looking uncomfortable. That's good. I'm uncomfortable too. Listen, I told you I go to Walmart trying not. Listen, the, the, the Lord, did I say this already? You know I done preached once, right? So if I said it already, just act like it's the first time that you heard it. But one of my life scriptures is Isaiah 50 and 4. And it says, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue, an instructed tongue to know the words that sustain the weary. But I don't like to answer the telephone. And the Lord said, Yolanda, how can I posture you to have the words that sustain the weary and you won't even answer their call? Yes, Lord. I'll answer the call. Yes, Lord. That, that's my exhortation to you this morning, my encouragement to you. Not a feel good, but a challenge. Would you give him your yes, even though it's inconvenient, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it goes against your personality? Give him your yes. However you want to do it, Lord. Leverage me and cause me to be a weapon to the doomed to rescue them and posture them for impact with an invitation. Are you here? So, so the Lord knew that we would be excited about the, the idea of Christianity. It sounds good and, and it's, you know, there's, there's spoils and there's, there's great perks to being a Christian and he knew that even in all of that we would avoid and distance ourselves because the obligation and the opportunities that we have been called to, because they are opportunities, um, they're, they're inconvenient. He knew that when he, he inspired 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 19. This is one of my most favorite, that's bad English, but you get it? It's my most favoritist. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. This is weighty. I love it. We are his ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. And God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Hallelujah. I'm an ambassador. You're an ambassador. What is an ambassador? It's an official representative of a foreign country. And the language in the scripture are so intentional. It's, it's, it's intentional. And I'm going to dive into it just a little bit to make this point. There's, there's several types of ambassadors. And so, so there is a diplomatic ambassador. And, and the function of a diplomatic ambassador is to facilitate relationship through compromise and, you know, negotiation. How can we get along? A trade ambassador 
The function of a trade ambassador is to negotiate exchange and commerce for profit and market position. But then there's a citizenship ambassador. Citizenship ambassador. The responsibility of a citizenship ambassador is to connect the eligible population to the process of becoming a citizen. And so for you and me as the church, we are citizenship ambassadors. And our responsibility is to represent the kingdom and to posture eligible, po eligible population, and that's the whosoever. And position them, why, how? Position them through invitation. So, so that they can become familiar and introduced and follow the process of becoming a citizen of the kingdom. Are you here this morning? That's you and that's me. Give God some praise for that. I want to execute my duties the right way. I'm, I'm never satisfied being mediocre at anything. And I'm mediocre at a lot of things. I'm just not satisfied with it. You understand? <laughs> And we spend hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars being experts at many things that have no eternal significance. We go to school and we will spend time and money to be an expert. Do you know what I want to be? I want to be an expert ambassador. I want my life to be such a reflection People are asking the question, where's she from? Are you here this morning? The church is God's idea. The church is God's idea. The church house is God's idea. Flaws and all. And the church is you and me. And we get the wonderful opportunity to partner with God's intention. Amen. Amen. So as I close, I love just um, how the Bible brings practicality to the principle so that we can, we can execute it. I need to see it. I'm practical. We used to do something called um, uh, Pastor's Collab, and, and we would just get around the table and whatever uh, text that Pastor was pondering for a message, we would, we would talk about it and go through his notes and all. And one of the things that I am known for, for just pressing is that how do we apply it? I mean, like, how do I leave after hearing a message and it's real and the conversation, the Lord is continuing long after I've left the building? Seven. The average Christian, and I know you are above average. The average Christian is in relationship with seven unchurched people. <clears throat> Invite them one at a time. And the Holy Spirit will give you the strategy on how to do it. John the Baptist, he understood the assignment. It was prophesied that he would herald the coming Messiah 400 years before he ever hit the scene. Isaiah saw it. He saw one crying in the wilderness. And, and uh, John the Baptist, as you know, he baptized Jesus and he had his own disciples. And Andrew and John were two of the two of the first disciples that were um, John the Baptist's disciples and they became disciples of Jesus. And John wrote five books of the New Testament, including Revelation. Wow. Andrew invited his brother Peter. And Peter and Andrew evangelized what we now know as Great Britain, the area known as Great Britain in, in, modern, in modern time. And the pilgrims trace their uh, roots to Christianity to Great Britain. And so when they traveled to the Americas, they brought their gospel with them. And so you and I are a product of Andrew inviting Peter and their, their, them evangelizing Great Britain and then bringing the gospel to America, you and I are a product of an invitation. Hallelujah. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Do you, do you feel the gravity of the moment? We have an opportunity 
to bring authenticity and credibility to the prophetic. God has intentions for the dude. And if they don't posture themselves and by invitation, we help them to posture themselves for them to become aware of God's intention for their life and fulfill the prophetic over their lives. One invitation can impact generations.